Hello and welcome to Engineering with Rosie Live. Um, give us a comment to let me know that you can see and hear us. Uh, sometimes I stuff that up, so it's always nice to know that I'm not talking into a void. Um, so today we've got an amazing guest, Phil Tataro, who I'm going to introduce properly in a second, but give us a wave, <laughs> Phil. Um, Hi, yeah, but first everyone watching, <laughs> tell me where you're listening from and whether you think that we're on track uh, to reduce emissions from the electricity grid, as that's the topic of our live stream today. So I'm going to start by thanking the sponsor of these live streams, which is WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, WeatherGuard Mech Strike Tape, a retrofitable lightning protection system for things that go fast, like wind turbines and aeroplanes. Um, yes, and I also need to thank the whole Engineering with Rosie um, Patreon team who support the, you know, the channel as a whole and, uh, yeah, I thank them for their help. And you can join us if you'd like. There's a link in the description of the video. Okay, so hi, Phil. Phil's the founder and CEO of Intel Store, and I'll just get you to introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about um, yeah, Intel Store and, and what they do and why you founded it. Thanks, Rosemary. Thank you for having me. Um, so I founded Intel Store 13 years ago uh, as a market research and consulting a company focused on the renewable energy sector, particularly power generation. Um, I've got uh, more than 20 years worth of um, engineering and R&D and business strategy experience, uh, having previously worked for three different Fortune 100 companies um, and about 16, 16 and a half years now in the wind energy industry, uh, having previously worked for a wind turbine OEM in the United States. Uh, so I'm again, I'm delighted to be here, and I, I think this is uh, a great topic you've selected for today. Okay, that's good. I'm yeah, I'm excited as well. I'm just going to change the layout because um, I'm cutting you off a bit. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about this topic because I've noticed that you know people talk about this a lot. You know, are we on track? The you know the goals are crazy, especially since you know when we started the net zero by 2050. That's a long way away, and it still is. Um, but everyone came up with interim 2030 targets. And, you know, in 2020 or before, that seemed like a long way away too. But now I think it's starting to feel like, hold on, that's, you know, like if you're planning a major project, you'll be happy if, <laughs> if that's, you know, ready by 2030 by now. So it's starting to feel a little bit close. And I have noticed that even amongst um, professionals working in the energy transition, there is quite a lot of pessimism around. And I don't often see people bringing data to these discussions. I mean, uh, I work mostly with engineers and we're supposed to be a very rational data-driven profession, but I do see a lot of emotions and, and feelings involved with these discussions. So yeah, that's why I wanted to get you on board to talk about some of the trends that you guys have actually, you know, studied the, the numbers and have a bit more, yeah, rational, rational insights to bring to the discussion. So let's just start with a few comments um, people have made about um, what did they ask if we are on track for um, decarbonizing electricity systems. So Sondon is calling in from Kansas, USA. Um, doesn't see the point when other major countries like China and India are not. Um, and I, that's a comment that I hear a lot and I definitely am really keen to make a video about maybe two separate videos on China and India separately and their energy transitions because I think that a lot of the talking points on those countries are a little bit out of date. Um, you know, you still hear people say, oh, China's bringing a new coal power plant online every three days or, you know, whatever it, whatever it was, but that's a few years out of date and um, those countries also have really... Um, are really installing a lot of things fast. So, yeah. But my take on that has always been it it doesn't mean that we shouldn't reduce emissions just because somebody else isn't, especially since, like, the bulk of historical emissions are from countries like the USA and Australia. So, um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think about that, Phil? Well, it's, it, there's a couple of points to make there. One is... China and India actually do have ambitions to reduce emissions. They're just not um, investing fast enough to, to get there, which you could actually arguably say about the rest of the world as well. Um, the issue with China and India, well, let's take India as a specific example, for instance. They come out with 
preposterous targets, and I'll just say it bluntly like that, um, that they can't, either they know they can't meet them or they're an aspirational target that they, they put out there um, for whether it's net zero or, um, uh, you know, renewable energy capacity additions or uh, electrification of their transportation system or what have you. Um, they they put targets out there that they don't back up with investment. And that actually gets to the heart of the matter. And and again, you can argue the similar thing with, with China, although China is now taking almost every square inch of desert that they've got and, and putting solar and wind out there um, and building the... the commensurate transmission to be able to accommodate that. Um, mm. The question is, are these countries doing it fast enough? And is it actually contributing to uh, enough of a reduction in emissions that's going to get you to net zero in the time frame that everyone's been specifying? I think that that time frame is really the operative thing. Eventually, we'll get to a net zero. How fast it gets there is really dependent on investment. And investment only gets triggered when people have confidence that the roadmap is a viable one. You know, they they want to see that this is something where we're we're on a glide path that's going to get us to um, you know, the the achievement of net zero targets and, and all that, that entails, the the renewable energy capacity additions that need to happen, um, the um, reduction in emissions from the transportation um, uh, sector, uh, building uh, energy efficiency and electric uh, efficiency. Um, you know, all of these things contribute to net zero. Um, a lot of people tend to either focus on one of those aspects and not the rest of them, or um, don't really um, spend the the money the right way in order to achieve those those targets fast enough. I think that's the the biggest issue that that I've seen. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I don't want to spend the whole time talking about China, but um, yeah, it is like I mentioned, it's a topic that's very interesting to me um, and India. But uh, if you've got things that you think are important to say about that, then do put them in the the comments. And if you're watching this video later on the replay, then um, yeah, I'll take a look at the comments later as well because I am keen to do a video on that. I'm actually just looking for um, <laughs> experts, energy experts from those two countries before I go ahead with that because I think it would be a little little odd to make a video about China's energy transition, for example, without talking to someone who's you know working in the energy sector in China. Um, so if anyone knows someone like that, then please suggest them to me. Um, from yeah. Tyrone uh, DeLille, we're not on track at all, very far behind. A big part of that is in Australia, um, the ban on nuclear energy. Um, so I think we'll probably talk about nuclear later because I know I've got some of the scenarios um, here and especially the US one, uh, there's an NREL um, study on you know zero emissions from electricity by 2035 and they looked at all the ways you could achieve it and nuclear um, was interesting in some of the you know ways that they chose to model that. So um, we'll talk about that. So got Bart de, I never know how to say the double A in, in Dutch. Um, I'm going to say Bart de Haas uh, in the Netherlands. We're also not on track at all and falling far behind. Um, Jim Arata thinks we're not I, on track. I, I agree with the comments, up. Rosie. <laughs> so there's no one that thinks that, you know, we're doing more than we than we should be. That's that's for sure. Um Okay, a couple of other comments that maybe we'll keep in mind for the top the conversation later on. Omar J, do you think cyber industrial security is an impactful or is tech in general general wasteful? Um, and yeah, and from Bart de Haas again, what do you think about the legal challenges when aiming for modernizing the grid? So I think that that's um, all good points that we'll keep in mind as we move forward. Yeah. Especially um, on trans transmission too. That'll right right of way when when it comes to transmission, we'll get into some of the legal issues. Yeah, and it's so different between Australia and the US. And um, yeah, if it wasn't for yeah. you know the comp complexities of time zones around the world, we should have had probably a European and um, someone in Asia as well to uh, yeah to talk about the challenges there because I think the grid problem is a lot easier to solve in Australia than it is in the US based on what I know. But um, yeah, you can tell <laughs> mm -hmm. me more about that. Um, okay, so I just want to start off with the, the reason why I wanted to do this um, 
this live stream was largely driven by a few scenarios that have been published. Um, so let me just share my screen and I'll go through. Okay, so the first one is this is Australia. Um, AEMO is the Australian energy market operator, I think. Um, and mm -hmm. their 2022 integrated system plan, which is a very catchy uh, title, but basically it's looking out over the next 30 years, how is the electricity market going to change and what do we need to do to, you know, um, respond to the challenges that that's going to raise. Um, so just find, I highlighted some bits. So the interesting thing about this um, is that it's not, it's not a target, right? They have just gone through and they surveyed all of the people um, within the energy industry um, about what do they think the most likely things um, are that are going to happen over the next 30 years. And um, so, uh, yeah, so most stakeholders identify the most likely was going to be uh, what they call the step change scenario, which is um, in the original ISP that they did back in the day, that was, I think, the most aggressive plan. And everyone was like, oh, you know, no way that will ever happen. But actually everyone in the industry agrees that that's the most likely, not, not that we should aim for it, but that's what's happening. So that's kind of a key point. Um, and that step change scenario gets people, um, gets renewables generating 83% of Australia's, or well, the east coast of Australia's electricity by 2030. Um, they highlight supply chain limitations and other factors threatening planned delivery of some transmission projects. Um, yeah, and then highlight that because, yeah, this is a projection, not a, a target or a wish or, a, you know, a desire that, they say our energy transmission is accelerating and irreversible. Um, and so I think that that's a, you know, a, a nice, nice point. Um, but not everyone has it as easy as Australia because we've got, you know, the nice advantage of having so much wind and solar around. So our projects are pretty cheap um, to roll out. And as a result, we've got coal plants that are closing down, not because anyone is telling them to, um, but because they just can't compete. They can't even pay their operational costs um, as compared to new wind and solar. Um, so they find that uh, by uh, 2050, I think this is, that we're going to almost double electricity delivered. Um, Coal-fired generation is withdrawing faster than announced and currently it's expected 60% will be withdrawn by 2030 and, um, yeah, you know, like someone that's living in Australia and reading the news every now and then do notice that coal closures only get brought forward, really. Um, they're never being pushed back. So when I see, you know, in the scenarios, a lot of people are talking a lot about stranded assets of coal, I... I'm not as worried about that because I've seen that, you know, when you lose money by operating your coal plant every day, that people turn them off. <laughs> so, you know, right. it's not, it's and, not and an hopefully, well, <laughs> Right. And hopefully redeploy that capital in a different form of, you know, renewable power generation that, I mean, even when we did some studies on the repowering of renewable assets, which is uh, an emerging trend in, um, you know, Western Europe and the United States, for instance, uh, we found that it's always cheaper to repower. You know, it, as long as you can get access to capital, which was the operative challenge, it's always cheaper to repower because over the lifetime of the asset and in the United States, for instance, it's like 10 years between, you know, your, your project uh, start date and the point in time when you've doubled your operational costs. Um, and so in, in Australia, it's not as uh, steep of a curve. It's maybe 15, 20 years. Um, but, you know, just like your car or any other piece of equipment, you know, the older it gets, the harder and more expensive it is to maintain. And so, you know, redeploying capital to building new power generation or at least a form of power generation that can be repowered more easily or replenished more easily um, it seems to make a lot of sense it's it's so much harder to um, you know decarbonize a coal plant uh, or uh, refurbish a coal plant uh, so why not close it and reinvest in renewable power generation mm. yeah 
Um, definitely agree. And I'll highlight another difference between Australia and the US. I think in the US, you've got a lot of like regulated monopolies, right, in the utility sector, whereas uh, Australia sort of, is yeah. a bit, bit more open. I think Australia yeah. as a whole is a bit more like Texas is, where, um, you know, if you think you can make money off it, uh, a generation or um, storage project, then you're pretty much to go free to go at it. And I don't think it's quite like that in the US. Um, yeah, right. Okay, is wrong. like in in the ear cut market in Texas, like you mentioned, it's kind of as long as you're not going to dilute the price in the merchant market by flooding the market with capacity, then you can play in the market. Um, mm. It's different uh, elsewhere in the US and, and elsewhere in the world where, you know, it. <sighs> A lot of it depends on transmission availability. We also have about two terawatts worth of um, power generation, actually even just renewable power generation. It's probably a good like two and a half um, or three terawatts worth of new um, power generation capacity additions in the queue in the United States that can't find a grid connection right now. Um, because it just doesn't, uh, we just don't have enough spare capacity in the system. Um, mm. So transmission availability um, is one key thing. And actually, this, this dovetails into the, the net zero scenario that we're working on right now, um, mm. which is we've determined, even though we haven't published our results yet, um, we've determined that there's something on the order of about 32.6 million kilometers of transmission lines globally that are necessary to be built in order to help facilitate um, the power, the renewable power generation requirement for net zero. Um, mm. There are also something on the order of like 450,000 substations um, that will also need to get built to complement that 32.6 million kilometers of transmission lines. Um, and, you know, all of that is going to have a price tag. It's mostly going to be paid by consumers and um, corporate power off takers of, uh, you know, the power that would eventually be transmitted. Um, and, you know, that's one of the additionally, one of the challenges is um, can you get consumers and corporates to agree to um, the concession fees that are going to be necessary in order to have that um, spare transmission capacity get built. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk more about transmission later because it comes up in every <laughs> every scenario. <laughs> and I think um, I'm starting to really change my mind about the role that transmission is going to have in the um, energy transition. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, let's just put that in the, in the car park and we'll come back to it. Um, yeah, definitely a huge huge issue. So let's just go back to this um, yeah, report about Australia's energy transition. And this this is a nice chart from that that just shows, you know, from um, what is this, 23, 24 over this um, left side all the way up to 2050 and then 2030 is, is here. So you can see the light yellow is distributed PV, so um, rooftop solar, and then the dark yellow is utility scale solar. And you might notice already Australia has a lot more rooftop solar than we have all of our utility scale solar farms together and that's another difference between Australia and the US but also Australia and the rest of the world I think um, definitely topic for a future video of its own I think that's really interesting the reasons why um, and then wind you can see wind expanding a whole lot moving forward um, then also categories that come from practically zero now and get bigger is distributed um, storage um, and then one of my favorite topics, coordinated um, DR storage. So using, you know, um, yeah, using all, all those distributed resources and generation in a coordinated way to, you know, solve, uh, make the, the challenge easier. Um, utility scale storage also going to get bigger. Hydro stays about the same because we don't have a lot of extra places to build dams, which is true for a lot of places in the world. Um, and then peaking gas continues all the way up to 2050 in this um, scenario, um, but all the other kinds of fossil fuels, so mid-barrack gas, brown coal and black coal phase out and coal pretty quickly. Um, yeah, and yeah, just two other points to <laughs> pull from this report before we move on. So it's going to have nine times the utility scale 
variable renewable electricity capacity. Um, right now we're installing them faster than at any time before and we need to continue the current rate to get to 2050. So for me it's, um, yeah, current rate for a decade and then increase it beyond 2030. So to me that's not so implausible for Australia. Um, yeah, but, you know, maybe other people disagree but like I said we've got an easy energy transition here compared to other places so next I'll move on to the US so this is an NREL report examining supply side options to achieve 100% clean electricity by 2035 so like I said in the Australian one it's a projection of where we're, we expect to go not um, a target this is the opposite they've identified a goal which was um, I think Biden uh, committed to 100% clean energy by 2035 or it's a, a goal or a target or a you know a, I hope that this happens I'm not sure to what extent it's, it's, it's more the latter <laughs> yeah it's not backed up with any credible pathway there yet as far well, as I understand it's also not backed up with a firm policy or uh, any kind of meaningful policy support other than what we already have in place which is like our uh, feed-in tariff, we call it the production tax credit and the investment tax credit yeah. um, that's available. But these, the United States is interesting because, as I kind of mentioned notionally before, you know, we we tend to f uh, provide uh, aspirational targets that you know people uh, don't know if we can actually achieve or not, but hopefully it spurs uh, you know a, a call to action. So that's that's the best way I guess I can describe what we tend to do. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing to note is, yeah, so I guess it's unfortunate timing for them because they made their report and then the Inflation Reduction Act, um, IRA or IRA. What are you guys in America calling it? IRA or IRA? It the IRA, Because yeah. there already was. I mean, some people IRA. might call it IRA. I, I don't. I call it IRA. Anyway. Okay. Um, so this, this report doesn't include that. Um, so right. there are, I think that, it will have an effect. I mean, it's a huge thing. And my yeah, my takeaway, and tell me if I'm wrong, but my really simple grab from it is, you know, it's so generous for its subsidies for hydrogen that you're going to kind of distort the technology mix that you might have ended up with if it hadn't had such generous hydrogen subsidies. What do you think about that? Yeah, and it's, well, it's interesting because it's, and there are other countries in the world that that have done this as well. They've been so generous with, kind of government subsidies that it's redirected capital towards those technologies, even though the technology isn't as commercially viable as others that, you know, if they had received the same level of subsidy, they would be the, the commercial winner. So like, for instance, wind and solar have already kind of proven themselves to be, you know, uh, in terms of their efficiency, you know, the, the, actual power generation efficiency, the capital efficiency, uh, however you want to look at it, um, you know, solar PV and onshore and offshore wind have really demonstrated themselves to be um, kind of the, the new, um, uh, you know, your, your best option for cost effective investment in power generation. The, the other thing with with this whole policy though is or policy recommendation or target is that you know it's it is kind of there in conjunction with certain um incentives that are supposed to spur a certain amount of investment in one direction or another um but then you get into the practical reality of technologies that are technologically feasible to, to implement, but they're not necessarily commercially viable um, to implement. The subsidy can help do some of the, uh, you know, bring some of the economies of scale for those technologies. Hydrogen's a good example of one uh, where obviously the, the chemistry and physics for, for hydrogen have been around for, for a couple hundred years. Um, it's just making a more efficient mousetrap, so to speak, making a more efficient fuel cell, um, making a more efficient storage capability. Uh, if we're going to use, um, you know, liquefied hydrogen in certain applications, how can we uh, mitigate losses and, and things like this? So it's it's interesting to see kind of the the way in which 
um, research and policy recommendations from you know entities like NREL and others have have kind of guided the the policy that gets formed and the subsidies that go along with it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And um, there was a good comment related to that from Jim Arata. Aspirational targets got man to the moon within a decade, and I can yeah I can see that. And there is to that there is a place right, to that for, point. Sometimes it works, but it doesn't yeah. always. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes yeah. it works, but it doesn't always. I do think there's been a little bit too much um, attention paid to targets people have made. Like, I, I don't think it's meaningless, um, but I also don't think um, in the energy transition, we don't necessarily need those targets in order to make progress because the technologies that we're transitioning to are just legitimately better. I mean, putting a man on the moon would never have happened if it you didn't, you know, specifically go out of your way to trial it. The free market wasn't going to just decide to do that, right? Like it didn't make anyone right. any money. But the energy transition is really clear in Australia. Um, there's there's money to be made by changing to these new technologies. And so um, I think people miss that whole side of it. They think it's only a big political problem to be solved. And that's why, you know, you see every time that we have a, you know, a big um, climate change summit, um, people... Uh, like, you know, uh, Greta Thunberg will say, you know, we've done absolutely nothing, the, this isn't enough, you know, the target's announced. But you can't say we've done actually absolutely nothing if you look at the, you know, the engineering <laughs> that's happened over the last, you know, 20 years that I've been working in the industry and even further, you know, before that. So much has happened um, and now we're, yeah, we're making real, real things are happening, um, yeah, which is obviously what we're going to talk about today. Just quickly keep on going through um, this uh yeah this report um and then we'll talk about yeah where, where we're up to or what's been happening um in the according to intel stores data over the last um years so in the nrel report they looked at four different scenarios to get to zero um emissions electricity by 2035 so there was their all options where um you know just you can do everything and come up with the smartest way to um reduce emissions so you know everything's on the table um, including new technologies that aren't widely rolled out yet like direct air capture also carbon capture and storage um, and I, I think that they also don't worry too much about transmission constraints or I assume that you'll be able to overcome those um, then the infrastructure renaissance means that you get even better transmission technologies and new permitting and siting approaches that allow greater levels of transmission deployment with higher capacity. That sounds like, I think everybody who's working in the energy transition, this is like a dream that we would be able to do something as sensible as that. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I don't know if anyone thinks that's realistic. I'm definitely starting to, I, I started off just assuming these things would happen because it makes the job so much easier. Um, and now I'm starting to think, okay, we need ways to achieve the energy transition without assuming that we're going to get all the transmission that we should have. Um, and yeah, then maybe you can talk in a second about, about how we're going on that. Um, then there's this constrained scenario where they've put in, you know, all these constraints, um, you know, assuming that people don't like certain technologies, they don't want to use very much land for wind and all that sort of thing. And I kind of got the impression this is a like a high nuclear scenario where they kind of, um, you know, added in constraints to get as much nuclear as possible into the system. Uh, maybe that's just my own biases um, assuming that, but that was the vibe I got from it. Um, and then there's a no CCS um, scenario, which is only one out of the four, which is interesting because CCS barely exists at all today. Um, and I've noticed that most of the net zero scenarios, like if you look at the IEA um, or even IPCC or, you know, any report that you'll look at, then you'll find just a whole bunch of carbon capture and storage in the future. And they usually have this like sharp inflection point where it's like, okay, this is historical <laughs> um, carbon capture and storage. And then from tomorrow, we start rolling out like this, um, which is kind right. of the opposite to what you see with forward projections for renewables. Yeah, they also um, looked at um, better efficiency and demand side flexibility to slow the annual load growth because all of these scenarios also have to include the you know, sector coupling where you're going to have more electricity to charge electric cars and um, heat pumps and instead of you know, gas furnaces and industrial heat, right. that sort of thing. Um, 
right. yeah okay so this is the you know the kind of the visualization of of all their scenarios the yellow is um oh these are the four different scenarios no the four different scenarios are, are down this way um and then the colored by the um generation so we've got solar in yellow wind is in blue um and then smaller ones elsewhere so yeah you've got lots of wind in most of the um scenarios and you know a lot more solar but yeah that's that's where that's at and then they've got one on transmission so that's kind of my overall summary of how they think that we're going to get there um and then uh later on maybe we'll go through some of their assumptions because it is really interesting to see in the different like scenarios um what they found the effect of you know say how much hydrogen that you assume or how much um nuclear that you end up with depending on what you constrain or not but i think i've talked about reports for too long so um yeah uh, the idea was, Phil, that you would fill us in on how things have been tracking first. So um, we need a whole lot more wind and solar immediately, storage in a little while, transmission as much as possible from, you know, as soon as possible and preferably sooner. <laughs> um, how are we going on any or all of those things? So the, the short answer is uh, it, we're, we're not actually doing terribly. We're not going to meet some of these targets that have been put in place for net zero, uh, like even some of the commenters have, have suggested. Um, we're, we're definitely not on track to where the targets have been set. However, um, much like you talked about before, Rosie, it, it kind of, you know, we've always found that it's it's hard to put like a time frame on something because it, it all really depends on the level of investment that you're willing and able to unlock. Um, we could achieve net zero within three to five years if we wanted to spend, you know, seven trillion dollars. But are we going to do that? No. So that's the, you know, or how quickly are we going to be able to do that is, is really more maybe the, the operative question. So the, the bottom line with it is there's, um, you know, renewable capacity uh, additions have been going reasonably well and, and the pace has been picking up. So we now have, I think, about 3.2 trillion um, or sorry, 3.2 terawatts worth of um, renewable energy power generation capacity in the world. Um, in order to achieve net zero, again, based on the modeling that we've done and we are doing uh, for this new report we're working on, it looks like it's going to take somewhere in the order of between six and a half and seven terawatts, uh, which means basically we have to double where we're at right now. Um, and again, that's going to take, uh, you know, a certain level of investment, probably around, um, you know, seven to ten trillion dollars to be able to do it. Um, so that's, you know, how quickly that money gets spent will ultimately determine how quickly we achieve net zero. The other aspects of net zero are um, the pace at which coal um, and, well, any other type of fossil fuel power generation is retired. Um, so, you know, again, like you've talked about, if you're going to be able to reduce the levelized cost of energy for nuclear, wind, solar, um, and storage capabilities, then it necessarily um, expedites the uh, the elimination of, um, you know, a lot of the fossil generation that, that still exists. Um, I mean, to be perfectly blunt as well, you know, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine has certainly helped also facilitate some of the the um, expediting of, of some of those coal plant retirements, uh, certainly throughout Europe, where they want to get off gas, they want to get off um, fossil fuels, and they want to be self-sufficient. Um, so that's that's been a part of it. Um, but then also consider that for net zero, you also have the transportation um, impact and the uh, energy efficiency uh, impact. So the, you know, the energy efficiency impact, you know, most people think that, oh, it just means get a heat pump. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, but the bottom line is the, the energy efficiency, um, impact for, to be able to achieve net zero is probably one of the, uh, areas where we're furthest behind, um, because we, we are, 
not necessarily governed by mandates in all countries everywhere in the world uh, that says, you know, you shall have solar on your roof um, if you're building a new uh, house or a new, you know, uh, multifamily, you know, housing complex um, uh, or even for commercial real estate. Um, you know, it, there's not enough mandates for things like um, uh, higher efficiency uh, bulbs and uh, light bulbs and things like that. So there's there's a lot of different technologies that already exist that are a bit expensive, but that's only because they haven't properly achieved economies of scale because there hasn't been a policy driven mandate to necessarily adopt the technologies. Um, so in the power generation industry, you notice that a lot of the um, independent power producers that were focused on fossils have transitioned over to renewables because they had a vested interest to be able to do it. Like you said, if they're losing money operating their fossil fuel based plant, um, you know, they have an incentive to, um, you know, to, to switch to something cheaper. For energy efficiency, consumers who are, you know, one of the largest chunks of that, um, uh, or the largest contributors to that, they don't always have, or they don't always see what the um, cost savings would be. You know, it's like they they don't want to spend. You know, if if a light bulb, um, you know, costs them, you know, a dollar or a dollar fifty uh, today, they're not going to spend like thirty dollars on a high efficiency light bulb, even though a high efficiency light bulb over ten years is going to ultimately save them money. So that's one of those things that they just can't necessarily always wrap their head around is total cost of ownership. Um, so that's that's a bit on the the energy efficiency. Uh, and then, as I touched on, lastly, it's transportation is also one of the single largest contributors to uh, a net zero. And whether or not we're going to fully electrify and, uh, you know, again, invest in all the ancillary things that are necessary to fully electrify, uh, are we going to actually utilize hydrogen as a transportation fuel? I'm kind of personally of the belief that I don't think it's particularly efficient. But again, there's lots of people that have lots of wacky ideas about, you know, just because the energy density of hydrogen is better than, you know, petroleum based products, it, that means we have to figure out ways of, of harnessing it. Well, technically, you can you can do that. But it's, you know, there's there's a big difference for uh, things that are technologically feasible versus commercially viable. And I think that mm. kind of falls into the, the realm. Then there's also could the I just, question um, of, oh, sorry, uh, just, just one, jump, one jump last thing. To, oh, yeah, yep. Yeah, just so the, the, the last bit of it is, are we actually going to, you know, in shifting away from petroleum-based fuels, are we actually going to shift to full electrification versus hydrogen? Or is there a, a middle road where a drop-in kind of synthetic biofuel would actually allow us to maintain the existing infrastructure that's already been invested in, in terms of petrol stations and, and everything, and not necessarily have to go down the path of you know, doing something that requires a significant amount of uh, engineering and investment. So, anyway, that was the that was my kind of summary on on what needs to happen to kind of speed up net zero. Yeah. Okay. Um, those are all good points, and I wanted to just um, come back to the NREL report because you were mentioning about hydrogen, and they've pulled out that um, the main, like the large differences in the scenarios between the amount of generation that's going to be needed uh, based on differences in storage um, and uh, associated losses with that, um, and hydrogen production because obviously if you're um, making green hydrogen from renewable electricity. Um, if you have a choice between, you know, say for a passenger car, if you have a choice between powering it with hydrogen versus uh, with electricity directly, you're going to need ultimately three times as much electricity to, you know, make the hydrogen and then put it in the in the passenger car right. than if you would yep. just, you know, charge a car battery directly. So if you roll out a lot of hydrogen, um, then you're going to need more generation overall, which obviously makes, you know, what everybody already thinks, are, you know, optimistic targets, they get harder if you start being, you know, um, just not caring about efficiency at all. Um, so the next thing I wanted to get right. your opinion on was they have said the required growth rates um, for 
getting to 2035 um, zero emissions electricity um, and in the range of 43 to 90 gigawatts per year for solar and 70 to 145 gigawatts per year for wind. So this is in the US. And I wondered if you have, um, I know you don't have the, <laughs> the facts and figures right at your fingertips, but do you have any idea what sort of amounts of capacity are being added currently and how much it needs to increase to see these amounts hit? Well, again, it, it depends on the time frame. So I, I do actually know some of the, the figures for renewable power generation. Um, you know, we're, we're adding somewhere on the order of, uh, you know, these days between 200 and 230 gigawatts a year, or at least that's what we're projecting for this year and, you know, some of the next years into the future. A few years ago, we were only adding globally about 100 gigawatts um, a year between, you know, wind, solar, hydro, biomass, um, you know, et cetera, all the, all the renewable power gener generation technologies. And we, we've kind of excluded nuclear from that, and we can, you know, talk about that. But um, so just for the pure renewable, um, uh, you know, technologies, you know, they're, they're, Again, it's it's on track to continue accelerating the pace of capacity additions. It's not on track to achieve some of the net zero targets that have been set. Um, it, I like we said, you know, if if you want to get to a net zero scenario, you're probably talking about doubling the current installed capacity of renewable power generation. And we can we can actually include nuclear in that in that conversation as well. Um, but again, you'd have to go from, you know, the current um, installed capacity of, you know, around 3.2 terawatts and get up to about seven, let's call it, you know, between we said between six and a half and seven terawatts, um, you know, again, the pace at which you do that there, are, there, it's almost one of those things where you even if you threw all the money that it would take to get there, you're not going to do that in like three to five years. Um, it's just the the pace at which that goes depends on how quickly that investment can be unlocked to be able to help um, deploy the renewable energy capacity faster. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're we're <laughs> moving in the right direction, but again, we're not on track for these artificially generated targets, whether you want to call them aspirational or otherwise, it's an artificially generated time frame for when we're supposed to achieve net zero. Eventually we mm -hmm. will achieve net zero period, you know, just like the AEMO report indicated you know we're we're going to get there eventually it's just the pace at which that happens largely depends on a lot of these um you know moving targets in terms of well how quickly are you going to add renewable energy how quickly are you going to retire fossil fuels um how mm -hmm. much are you going to increase the efficiency of some of the renewable technologies how um you know how much are you going to get out of um you know, energy efficiency, how much are you really going to get out of uh, transportation efficiency? So it, it just, there's there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of assumptions that go into uh, a net zero model that um, mean it's hard to set a time frame unless you can nail down some of those specific types of assumptions. Um, mm. So yeah, we'll, we'll get there okay. eventually. It's just how quick do you want to go? Yeah, and I will I probably just um, argue against the idea that it's an artificial constraint. It's an artificial constraint in terms of the engineering and the economics, but in terms of the climate, I think it's not necessarily oh, totally course, arbitrary. Yeah. <laughs> no, of course. Didn't didn't mean to imply that. I'm just saying no, it's, no, yeah. you know, some politician decided, oh, we're gonna just do this by twenty thirty five or twenty fifty yeah. or whatever, because that's a and, nice round number. And so that's that's what I meant. And I do <laughs> I do actually get a bit annoyed at the, you know, at first when we came up with or when people came up with net zero by twenty fifty, I thought that's so great, you know, it's so catchy and simple. Um, but I get more and more annoyed with it every day until now I think that it's, you know, <laughs> it's past its its usefulness. Um, we needed something at the time. We needed something to cut through because people were still arguing about should we do something, can we do something about climate change. But now I just think that it it's too simplified, um, too arbitrary, and it really, when you say 
net zero, the immediate thing that everyone does is focus on the very, very hardest thing, you know, the hardest 1% um, and wants to spend all their attention on long haul aviation or, you know, something like that. Um, some really hard, really hard stuff and you know long haul aviation mm -hmm. i don't know it's less than definitely less than much less than one percent of um global emissions so um what we really should be doing is focusing on the really easy 70 80 90 percent which is um you know electrifying everything and then uh making our electricity grid um 100 percent renewable so i th yeah I, I i'm not not such a fan of net zero as i as a you know a slogan as i used to be um, <laughs> right. but it, I mean, again, conceptually, like what we're trying to do is, it, and it's not even, I mean, regardless of what anybody thinks about, like, um, you know, the, the causes of climate change, et cetera, et cetera, it, it's net zero is something that's ultimately going to happen because it's going to be good for business. It's going to be good for consumers. It's going to be, you know, good for pollution. It's going to be, you know, there's a lot of benefits that people, you know, get distracted from really thinking or talking about because um, people get so kind of emotionally charged up about, you know, uh, certain aspects of climate change. And it's like, mm. there, there's all kinds of reasons why this will ultimately prove to be commercially viable in addition to technologically feasible. Um, and, it, you know, it, it will have the ancillary benefit of helping the, the climate in in the process so you know i again that's the the position mm. that i've always or or the perspective i've always uh taken with with this yeah yeah okay All right, we're running out of time let's go to some questions there's been some really good comments um in the comment section and then we'll try and finish up with more talk about transmission since that's the you know number one issue mm. um yeah so we'll start up with a comment from Jim Arata. Green, grid connections are already at the coal plants and store renewables in their place. And um, Tyrone says that's not always possible, um, but using those grid connections with nuclear energy is definitely something we can do. Um, and the Department of Energy is already investing in this. And I'll just add that in Australia, we see, oh, I'm noticing all sorts of, companies, um, developers are uh, coming up with ways to use old coal power plants, either the power plant itself, um, for example, for energy storage, you know, if you've got any kind of thermal energy storage, then you might be able to use the steam turbine for, you know, still generating electricity. Um, and maybe that will happen. But what I see as the more likely thing is um, most of the coal power plants are close to the, the coast. I mean, most Australians live near the coast all of the offshore wind farms that are proposed in Australia rely on getting themselves to basically to a coal power plant right. because all the transmission is already in, in place. Therefore, you know, just like a huge chunk of um, energy that's going to, you know, go into the transmission network. So it's lots of things yeah. that you can do with. Well, <laughs> coal and just power plant. one, one quick anecdote on that as well. Like in Germany, for instance, they, they have done exactly that. You know, anytime they've um, tried to, you know, uh, interconnect a new renewable energy asset like wind or solar PV, they've tried to do it, um, you know, in uh, a place where they've got, you know, spare capacity in the the coal or other type of power plant. So, you know, that that's, it, it just kind of depends on the type of transmission uh, and electrical system infrastructure that you already have to be able to take advantage of it. Australia is fortunate in that regard that, you know, because you want to shift from, you know, coastal, um, you know, fossil fuel based power generation to coastal offshore wind or floating solar power generation that will still be able to leverage the excess, the existing electrical infrastructure. It's actually going to be the most cost effective way of uh, doing that kind of a transition. So mm. it's not okay, always a bad a idea. Um segue into this comment from Sonnen. Aspirations are nice, but how do we pay for all these aspirations? We're 32 trillion in debt. And the latest story is the US hitting the debt ceiling. Um, I can't remember where who it was. But I mean, there's been a series of, of scenarios that have costed the energy transition. And the latest one that I saw was just highlighting the fact that this is the cheapest way to, um, you know, have an energy system in, in 2050 in Australia, definitely in the US, definitely um, in most places around the world, this is just going to be the cheapest. 
Um, also, when you know we add up, oh, we need this much investment in transmission um, every year. We are currently investing in transmission and other kinds of infrastructure, and I don't think that the figures are so different um, in terms of money. To, to me, I don't see people talking about money being the problem so much as getting the money in the right place and being able to build the projects that, you know, you've got the money, but you have to be allowed to actually put a power line on this piece of land yes. to do it. Is that your yes. impression too? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just to <laughs> provide you a short answer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, that's good. Good. Short answers are good. Um, oh, there was one question that um, I wanted to bring up just because I happen to know the answer um, from Aramite. Hypothetically, how many square feet of PV solar a company with battery storage would be needed to power all of Australia, not to mention kilometres of transmission lines? Well, the first part I did, I just, I made a video for um, Fully Charged. So if any of you haven't checked it out, I'll try and put a link to the description or you can just probably search my name and Fully Charged. Um, but I've got the script for it here. Um, and I did some calculations on that exact question. About 0.1% of Australia needs to be covered in solar panels to generate all our energy from solar. And for wind, onshore wind, it's about double that. And yeah, so if you include offshore, then it is less. And obviously those technologies don't use up the land. Most of our solar is rooftop solar. Most of our wind is in farms with, you know, sheep or whatever underneath it. So yeah. the amount of and land is laughably small sorry each, each yeah each wind turbine only takes up you know 25 square meters uh, once it's fully installed and commissioned and all all that bit so you know you're you're yeah. not actually talking about a rather significant uh the the rest of the land is is usable so to 25 yeah. square meters per turbine is really not that much space yeah yeah, no, I agree. And the NREL report, which I, I will link to all those sources that I've been showing today in the um, description, that also goes through land use. And um, yeah, because wind, especially nu nuclear fans always want to compare nuclear to wind. And um, every time people compare land use from the energy technologies, they get wind wrong because they it makes it sound like it uses up all that land, but it, it doesn't. Yeah, the I mean, space in between, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, the thing that they don't do if they're comparing to fossil fuels is include all of the land that you need for mining fossil fuels. You know, it's not just about the land that the power plant takes up. You've got to feed it as well. Let's let's go back to transmission then, because I don't know. How are you how are you feeling about transmission? Um, I had the that NREL report has uh, let's bring that up again because it's got some figures on how much we need. So, yeah, so total transmission capacity in 2035 needs to be 1.3 to 2.9 times current capacity. And their 1.3 figure, that would be in their, like, constrained um, mm -hmm. <laughs> scenario where they're right. purposely telling it, don't build much new transmission. <laughs> um, yeah, so 14. 1,400 to 10,000 miles of new high-capacity lines per year, assuming we begin in 2026. Um, mm -hmm. And it constructs, yeah, oh, yeah, the infrastructure renaissance scenario constructs the most transmission and wind um, and results in the lowest average system cost, which um, is kind of obvious that the less you constrain your model, the cheaper that its answer is going to end up. You mentioned some figures about miles of transmission, I think, at the start, didn't you, Phil? I yeah, so don't recall them, what, but how do yours compare to been, these? Yeah, what we've been studying is kind of uh, in order to achieve net zero, regardless of the time frame, again, what actually needs to transpire. So for the, the amount of... Um, you know, renewable capacity additions that need to be made. Again, we need to almost double, you know, slightly more than double what we currently have installed. Um, it's going to require something on the order of about 32.6 million kilometers of additional transmission lines. Uh, on top of that, it's going to take something on the order of another 450,000 substations being built uh, globally. And again, that's kind of that would also be kind of the the minimum, probably most constrained scenario. We're again, we're still working on some of the crunching some of the numbers, um, but that's at a minimum what needs to be built. Um, the the bottom line with that is, it's easier to build transmission in some countries than others. Uh, certainly, Australia, you have 
fewer issues with getting uh, land use rights than you would in the United States, in Western Europe. Um, there are people talking about, you know, well, do we do we have to necessarily have the overhead transmission lines, or even though it would be more expensive, can we just bury them? Because then, you know, it, it at least eliminates some of the um, land use rights and land use constraints. Um, you know, you don't have that uh, high tension line tower uh, every, you know, whatever it is. It's, I think it's like every uh, 500 meters or something. Uh, so, you know, it's it's just one of those things. And, and even to go back to the beginning of this conversation and talk about China, China is actually a country that has heavily invested in a, a rather highly redundant um, high voltage uh, transmission capacity. The problem that they have is that they don't have the right kind of grid management technology and they don't have the right, um, it's not always going into the the right load centers. You know, they, they've built like an excessive amount of transmission capacity because they could from some of their desert regions to the big cities, but they don't have all the power generation out there in the desert yet. Um, and so, it, you know, it's a, it was a proactive thing for them to do to, to build all that transmission capacity, but it's also meant that they've had a lot of curtailment issues in the past and they've gotten through a lot of it now. Um, but it's, it's just one of those things where transmission is ultimately the key that unlocks, you know, if we're going to do the cheapest possible net zero, electrification is probably one of the best ways to do it. Um, I'm not even a fan of 100% electrification, to be perfectly blunt about it, but um, you're certainly going to need transmission to, to help facilitate net zero, and you're going to need a lot of it. And how we do that and how quickly we do that is ultimately going to unlock the pace of renewable capacity additions, and that's going to help unlock you know, uh, everything else we talked about, the, the scenarios around, you know, fossil fuel retirements and, um, you know, what we do with transportation electrification or uh, some other type of, um, you know, transportation system transition from, you know, petroleum-based fuels to uh, either electrification or a synthetic biofuel. Yeah, okay. So one thing that I've been thinking about with this is, like, to what extent do you think that we're going to let uh, let the lack of or the difficulties with more transmission you know getting enough transmission it's very difficult it's starting to seem impossible to me um do you think we're just going to say oh, okay well we'll slow down then or do you see new technologies emerging because that's what i see you know my whole career i've been working on um, technology development engineers love yeah. a constraint you know it helps breed creativity um, and I am starting to see a bigger role. I'm going to, I'm going to assume that we're going to have a bigger role from, um, technologies that don't require more transmission. So yeah, rooftop solar, distributed energy, maybe community batteries, as well as household batteries, um, demand <laughs> response, you know, don't you think that we'll start to find ways to not need it if it, if it really is so insurmountable? Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I don't think it's insurmountable. I think there are technologies like high temperature superconducting wire that could be implemented. Although, again, it's a bit expensive, but if you commercially deployed it at enough scale, you'd, you'd actually see benefits from it. But one thing that we did study a number of years ago was that if you actually had um, distributed generation in basically every community in the world, you would not need the you know, significant investment in transmission infrastructure because everybody would be able to, you know, generate locally and consume locally, um, you know, whatever they needed. Put it another way, if, if you had everybody um, with rooftop solar in the world uh, or, you know, uh, leveraging, you know, a, a regional uh, based wind farm or something uh, or a regional based, you know, small modular reactor or something, what, if you want to use nuclear, if you were generating locally and consuming locally, you wouldn't need uh, a significant amount of additional transmission infrastructure. Um, so distributed generation is actually something that uh, it, it's almost talked about like it's a buzzword, but in reality, it could be the key that unlocks a lot of this net zero transition. Um, but it's also, 
it's something that I think a lot of institutional investors don't find sexy enough to invest in. They, they want to be able to invest in like, you know, a utility scale wind farm or solar project, um, you know, billions of dollars in, in that type of thing, rather than, you know, okay, well, we'll give this community like a hundred thousand and that community 150,000 and everybody can kind of build what they want. Um, I, I think the, the investors don't, provide enough interest or backing to really support distributed generation in the way that it might or the way that it could be fully leveraged to help the the net zero and energy transition. Mm. I think that politicians, I don't know if they're really um, aware of this, that there's other other solutions. If transmission proves too hard, then they should consider incentivizing, you know, some of the other things to to take the the load off. And um, I will, where was it? Oh, I just lost the comment that I had. Yeah, from Tyrone. Nuclear requires less transmission. Why do you keep ignoring that, Rosie? Um, the answer to the question, why do I keep ignoring it? Uh, in Australia, I ignore it because it's it's banned and it's not going to be the cheapest or fastest solution. Um, but the US has some nuclear um, and in the NREL scenarios, definitely nuclear plays a role. I think in most of them, nuclear expands a little bit. Um, in their most ambitious nuclear scenario, which is where they constrained everything. So they said, you know, like it's hard to find land for transmission, hard to find land for wind. Then they ended up with a whole lot more nuclear. And uh, let's see if I can find it in there. But basically they you need to install a lot more nuclear than has ever been, like than the fastest rate that's ever been um, installed in the, the US to, to get there. So... Somewhere it says that you would need to increase nuclear by um, faster than has ever been um, installed before by a significant margin. Yeah. Um, well, and the the challenge with that, just to put a maybe a, a, yeah. a, a small point, I guess, on this is that if you look at the last like ten or twelve nuclear projects that have been built, they've all been like almost three times the time frame that they said it was going to take to build it and cost almost double the triple the amount um, to to build it. So that's I mean, even with improving technology, and I mean there there are, you know, again, this is mostly focusing on large nuclear plants as opposed to like the small modular reactor technology and the fusion technology that's being developed. But some of that still needs to be developed to the point where it's kind of commercially viable. Again, there's this difference, and a lot of engineers don't always appreciate this, that the difference between technological feasibility and commercial viability is sometimes a big gulf that you have to uh, manage to, to cross. And we're not quite there yet with all of the new nuclear technologies that could actually be efficient and effective um, you know, the large nuclear capability that that can be built right now probably wouldn't be built cost effective and efficient enough to, to really make that much of a dent and certainly is not going to go in that overly constrained scenario. Uh, you're not going to see that that type of a scenario ever being commercially viable because it just people I mean, if people aren't complaining about spending the money, they would on something like that. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I mean, I, I'm I've got no problem with um, with nuclear where it makes sense for cost and speed issues, um, which I, I don't believe that that's Australia. I know I'm getting some um, push pushback in the comments about that, but I mean, none of the data suggests that it's it, it compares for Australia. Um, I think it's a yeah a total red herring and a way to just delay doing the things that we we are doing. Um, we're actually moving very fast in Australia right now, and um, so this would be a way to you know getting sidetracked on nuclear would be a way to you know slow down the energy transition um, in my opinion. So I don't talk about it, but no problem with nuclear where it makes sense. And yeah, the US and a lot of Europe, um, you know, it's part of the mix now and and should be. Um, from this book, How Big Things Get Done, which is a really interesting one uh, by this Danish guy, um, Flubia, who has looked at big infrastructure projects and how they um, tend to, to track compared to their budget and time frame. Um, and so he's listed all them all out by category in this appendix to that book. Um, and so, yeah, from the most cost overrun at the top to the least at the bottom, nuclear storage right at the top, followed by Olympic Games, then nuclear power. So nuclear power has a main cost overrun of 120%. 
55% of projects have more than a 50% overrun and the worst ones are, are more than 200% over um, their yeah. budgets. And so at the exact opposite end of the scale, solar power, energy transmission. Energy transmission is so good, so why can't we do more of it? But, you know, it's obviously got other problems. Um, wind power. So that, I think, is a really nice factual um, representation of why we can't put all our eggs in the nuclear basket. You know, it can only be, okay, let's try and do this in parallel. And I'm interested to see where small modular reactors go. There's some, um, yeah, some benefits that might be unlocked. I'm skeptical it's going to actually play out the way it that people say. Um, yeah, anyway, I have a video on my channel about um, New Scale, which is probably the front runner for SMR if you want to check it out. But, um, yeah, we've gone over time already actually by quite a bit. So, <laughs> Phil, I'll let you tell me, did we miss anything major that you really wanted to talk about? And would you come back when you you said you're working on a new um, net zero um, projection, right, that you'll have all sorts of nice charts and data at hand. Would you come back and talk about that when yes. you finish it? Oh, of course. So I think there's, you know, we, I think we covered most of what we can in, in the time frame. Um, hopefully everybody that that's uh, listening and watching today, uh, uh, you know, appreciated some of the, the discussion. We certainly appreciated all your comments um, and we'll try and look through them and, and answer some more as, as we can on social media. You can certainly follow myself on uh, and find me on LinkedIn. Uh, and I know Rosie's on LinkedIn as well. So uh, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to come back and, and talk some more once we have uh, more concrete data uh, to back up what, we, uh, what we're seeing. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I want to say also, I think that the comments in this live stream have been the best that we've that we've ever had in the Engineering with Rosie live stream. So thanks everyone for commenting. There's quite a lot of really good ones that I didn't get to and I'm noting for next time. So example, Bruce King, um, did I comment explicitly on Mark Jacobson's detailed modeling for 100% sun, wind, water? I did not, and I will note that as one to talk about another time. And then there was another model that um, Jim Graham says, net zero, Australia's net zero 2015 needs to be with prosperity and twice population. Professor Garno told CEDA last Friday, Australia needs 50 times more power generation. Professor Finkel estimated 28 times. So I'll have to look up what those exact models were, but there was one released recently that came up with similar huge numbers. And it, I have I have thoughts and a few feelings and opinions about that one because they started as their premise that Australia is going to continue exporting the same amount of primary energy. Um, so the amount of coal gas that we export now, we're going to not just make up for the amount of useful energy that people get out of that once they've burnt it, but we're going to make up for the, you know, the amount of, of waste as well. And that, um, yeah, and so that means, you know, exporting just absolutely ridiculous amounts of, of hydrogen that is not based on anybody saying we want to buy this much hydrogen. It's saying, well, obviously, we're going to continue to sell the same amount of primary energy. Therefore, here's this, you know, insane scenario that just scares everybody and makes them think that it's, you know, totally implausible. So. Yeah. That's, well, that's and if if you can't if you can't even get the uh, everybody on board with building that transmission line to Indonesia, then I don't see how you're going to export uh, any more than you already are. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Well, no. I mean, hydrogen. That's what they think. Liquid hydrogen, or, or some other way to you know throw away even more of the um, primary energy. But anyway, <laughs> we've gone way over. So that's a topic for another day. Thanks. Thanks so much, Phil, for coming, and I will hold you to your promise to come back. Um, thanks everyone for watching and for the great comments and also to WeatherGuard Lightning Tech for sponsoring the live stream. They also have a great tech newsletter and a podcast, which I co-host with Alan Hall and Joel Saxon each week. And the links to all that's in the description. Um, in the podcast, we talk about all kinds of clean energy tech. And in the latest one, we talk about a new bird detection technology for wind turbines. Um, and I'm actually working on a video about wind turbines and birds. Finally, you should have done it three years ago, but I'm finally doing it now. Um, and in the latest podcast, we also talked about a new wind turbine blade recycling method and critical minerals and specifically Australia's opportunity to get more into mineral processing. It's one of my passions, that topic. So check that out on your favourite podcast app or you can watch it here on YouTube. Um, and I also need to thank, again, the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team for their support. If you want to join the team, then there is a link in the description. 
Um, and yeah, thanks everybody for watching and thanks again, Phil, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks.